Well, good morning, Bethany. Uh, So glad that you are here today. If you don't know me, my name's Evan, and I'm one of the pastors here at Bethany Church. Can I tell you uh, something that it's been such an amazing journey? I've been with Bethany for eight years, and uh, man, I've just gotten to see so much uh, take place in God's people because you are ultimately the church. Seven weeks ago, we had 18 people that planted themselves uh, along with a whole crew of folks that are launching themselves into our Princeton location that is uh, based out of Showplace Cinema. Uh, So glad that you guys are here with us. And then, you know, three years ago, we had 55 people that said they were going to plant themselves into the Vincennes community and location. And 192 years ago, uh, seven charter members uh, began what was known as Bethany Christian Church in rural Montgomery that is now today right here in our Washington location. So wherever you're joining us, let me just say welcome. Uh, I am glad that you are here today and ultimately you are the church because the people of God are the church. It's, it's not a building, it's not a location. No, the people are the church. You know, I've watched the kingdom of God advance and grow over the last eight years here at Bethany. I've been reminded of this truth that the church of Jesus Christ on earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one. That we are one church, albeit we meet in multiple different locations. You know, we don't aim to be the best church in our communities. And we say, say it like this, right? We, we instead aim to be the best church for our communities. And outside of a few purpose statement goals that are on the walls and our, our common spaces, uh, we, we don't really plaster our purpose out there for, for folks to see. We believe that the purpose will simply just be lived out in the people of God. We believe that if if we keep the vision, right? Remember the vision was to exalt Jesus Christ so that what? So that all would be saved or will be saved. If we keep that central, it will challenge us to live that out for him. And then we will then be on mission. And we believe if we say on mission, we'll get lost people saved and saved people pastored, pastored people trained and trained people mobilized to reach lost people. Lives will be changed that point others to life change, that point others to life change, that point others to life change, right? Now, vision drives mission, and mission develops purpose. And our purpose at Bethany Christian Church is to exalt Jesus Christ as Savior so that every person will will know God, that they'll live free, that they'll find purpose, and they'll become a difference maker. You know, when Christ died, he left his church, us, responsible for the ministry, the continued ministry of Christ is happening through his church. That's what Jesus tells us in John 14, verse 12. Listen to what it says. It says, I tell you for certain that if you have faith in me, you will do the same things that I am doing. No, you'll do even greater things now that I am going back to the Father. That the ministry is going to continue in and through the people of God. As one minister put it, God is not calling us to go to church. God is calling us to be his church, the hope of the world. We believe that there is strength in the local church. Why? Because Jesus believed that. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. It's on page 797 in the Bibles that are provided to you. Uh, If you want to grab that out, that'd be great. Um, Now, Jesus is with his disciples in this passage, and he's traveling, and uh, he shares some powerful words about the church. Words of the church that, that echo from one generation to the next, from one century of life to another, from one mission of difficulty and one mission of ministry, words that explain how the church can find their hope and how they can recognize th- their strength. These are, these are Jesus's words, his establishment and endorsement of the power of the church, God's, God's people. You know, in the late 16th century, you know, long before they had GPS or satellite technology or access to Siri or Google Maps, navigators used a guiding star that gave them the directions, that gave them the way, the right way. French and Latin language referred to this star as Sinistura. It's the North Star, uh, which today sits in the constellation of Ursa Minor, or better known as the Little Dipper. Uh, ancient mariners noted that all the stars seemed to revolve around this particular star 
and they relied on it to guide their navigation. By the 17th century, that word, sinecure, had been turned to sinecure. It was being used figuratively to, to mark any body or any one thing that things were centering around, that attention and admiration was given to. You know, our purpose is driven by our mission, but it's steered by our vision. And it all starts with Jesus at the center. Look, we believe that Jesus must be the center of all that we do. Nothing, none of this other stuff matters if Jesus isn't at the center, if Jesus isn't the focal point. With Jesus, we're going to have everything we need, but without him, we, we will truly have nothing. Jesus has to be the center. He's, I mean, really, he's only, the only thing that can combine this conglomeration of all of us together, the only thing that brings us all together is the fact that we have trusted Jesus or that we're exploring Jesus. There's something about Jesus that we're interested in. He is the focal point. He is the, the sinister. Now, that passage from from Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, reads like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Now they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. You know, the pressure seemed to be mounting. Jesus knew that his days were beginning to be limited. Who did people say he was? Now, I, you know, I don't believe that this is so much about Jesus figuring out who people were saying he was. I think he probably already knew that. I think this was more about him helping his disciples to figure out who he was. Well, some say John the Baptist, they said. Now, John the Baptist had proclaimed the coming of Jesus, but John was a, a spokesperson for the new age of Christ. Jeremiah, Jeremiah was one of the prophets of the Old Testament, one of reform and hope that told of the coming Messiah. Elijah, Elijah was one of the miracle workers and prophets of power. I mean, each of these prophets had significance, but Christ, Christ was so much more. I mean, even John himself had said, the man who is to come after me, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. I mean, these men were the promoters. Jesus was the promoted. These, these men were pointing people to the way. Jesus was the way. Who do you say I am? Jesus asked, and Peter gave that response, right? You are the what? The Messiah, the son of the living God. And there you have it. This is the moment, right? This is the moment in Jesus's life where things begin to shift. He begins to help them realize that he is headed to death on a cross, right? And, he, and things begin to shift in the life of the, the ministry. These men are beginning to grasp who Jesus really is. You are the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're the savior. You're the son of God. And Jesus praises that response from, from Peter. And then he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, some believe what Jesus is saying here is that Peter is the rock of which he is going to build the church on. Uh, I, I think Jesus realized that one mortally flawed man was not going to be the rock of which he built his church on. Not that Peter wasn't significant. Peter didn't have purpose. Peter didn't play a, 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 an eternal difference maker in this, this, this grand story of God. But it wasn't Peter. It was the confession that Peter had shared. That you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That was the rock, the thing of which the church is built on. It's the thing that brings us to where we are at today as his church. It's the thing that can unite three kings campuses to be one church in multiple locations is the thing that unites churches across our country and across our world, that Jesus is at the center of all that we do. You know, that term for church that's used here in the original language is ecclesia. That means the called out ones, that Jesus has called out his church. This is the first time in the New Testament that ecclesia is used in this passage. Now the church the church isn't that building, right? The church isn't a religious institution. The church isn't an ethnic group. No, it's just a group of God's people committed to him, committed to Christ with one purpose, 
and that's that Jesus would be lifted high, that Jesus would be exalted, that Jesus would be at the center. It's used 99 more times in the New Testament, 90 of which refer to the local congregation of believers. So if the establishment of the church is built on the confession of Christ, then that's, that's gotta be what we build the church on as well, that we focus ourselves on, that we, we don't forget our first love. And look, you guys have caught this. There are churches in our communities that have walked away from their first love, that have forgotten Christ, that have bowed to cultural relevance, that have fallen to the adversary scheme, that have laid themselves out to greed and pride and selfish ambition, that have allowed themselves to be strewn away by a whole slew of sins that have led to a widening path of destruction. And there are places that dress up and have the resemblance of the church, but have forgotten Christ. And because of that, they are not the church. God's word makes it clear. Jesus has to be the center of all that we do. He's got to be the foundation. First Peter chapter two, it calls him just that. It says that the stones that the builder had rejected have become, it's become the cornerstone that Jesus has become the cornerstone. Now, if you know anything about a foundation, the cornerstone is highly important in the foundation of a facility. And if you remove the foundation, what happens? The house falls, the building crumbles. Jesus has to be the foundation. Just like if you remove Jesus from the church, you've lost the foundation and the, well, it crumbles. As well, the scripture calls Jesus the head of the body, right? The body of being us, his body. We are the ones that are performing the works of Christ by being the hands and feet of Jesus. But if you are to decapitate somebody, they're dead, right? If you were to cut off the head of an animal, it dies. Just like if you cut off the head of the church, Jesus, then it is, it's, it's a dead church. So here at Bethany, we recognize if Christ is the center, what more are going to enter? More are going to enter through the doors of our building. They're going to hear a message of hope, be encouraged by the, the word of God, and they're going to walk out of here entering into relationships with people who are truly the church, you all, right? And because they've known you, and because you've lifted high the name of Jesus, they're going to see Jesus in you. And because they see Jesus in you, then they're going to enter into a relationship with Christ himself, and that will change everything about them. You know, since our vision is to exalt Jesus and our mission is to help others become like Jesus, then our purpose, it's always gonna be about Jesus. That's why our purpose is stated like this again, right? At Bethany Christian Church, it's to exalt Jesus Christ as Savior. Make sure he's the center so that every person will know God, that they'll live free, that they'll find purpose, and that they'll be difference makers. We believe that if Jesus is at the center, there's gonna be these four foundational movements that are happening in each and every one of our lives. First, you're gonna to come to know God. You know, I have a friend, his name's Aaron. Aaron is uh, somebody that attends our Vincennes location. Aaron's been attending on and off probably for about a year now. About six months ago, Aaron and I sat down for lunch and Aaron was like super honest and open with me and told me about some things that he was struggling with and, and just said, man, look, I, I'm just in a, not in a great place. He said, I, I've been going through the motions for a long time, you know, doing what, doing what Christians are supposed to do. You know, like, I come to church when it's convenient. Um, it's kind of what he said. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe we're not doing what, a Christ follower should do. And, and I, I, I'm there when I can. And he just said, look, I, I know that there are some things that are wrong. He said, I know I need to do something else, that, that I'm in a bad place. I'm not in the right place. And my, my encouragement to, to Aaron was, Aaron, I want you just to press in. I want you to commit to some things. I want you to take some next steps. For Aaron, his next step was joining our Rooted experience that kicked off in the fall. He was a part of this 10-week experience that helps to build out seven spiritual rhythms in your life. And Aaron came to me last week. They just finished up the Rooted experience. And man, he and I sat down, had this, this meal together, and he's just like, Evan, my life is so much different. I, I, feel, I feel like I, I've never been this close to the Lord in my life. He said, there's been a transformation. And I can see that transformation happening in Aaron's life because what? because he took his next step. You now, Matt mentioned a few weeks ago that one of our core values is that we welcome both the worshiper and the doubter, right? The one who doubts. We recognize that there are folks in this place that believe that Jesus is the Christ. And there's others of you that may be a little bit skeptical. However, there's one thing we ask of everybody that walks through here is that they, they be willing 
to ask some of the questions. They'd be willing to explore some of the, the, the things that they have questions to. They, they look after God. They explore who God is. Einstein said it like this, nothing happens until something moves. Look, look some of you need to start making some moves. Like you need to start taking some steps. Look, you're never gonna truly fully know God. God is infinite. We'll always be experiencing and discovering more about the God whom loves us, and the God whom we serve. So whether you're a believer or a doubter though, we can all come to know him a little bit more. But some of you are here today because you want to know God in a greater way. And others of you are just saying, I don't know about this whole God thing at all. Let me tell you this, we are gonna dedicate ourselves as a church to seeing to it that you come to know God and to grow in God. Whether it be ministries like Sunday services or Celebrate Recovery, things like small groups or Rooted or high school ministry or middle school ministry or Be Kids, everything that we do inside of programs, are, there's a catalyst that helps so that people will come to know God in a more full way. So whether you're a, a worshiper or a doubter, my encouragement is ask your questions. Explore God, because I believe if you ask the questions that he's gonna answer. If you explore, you're gonna find what you're looking for. Listen, listen to what it says in Matthew 7, verse seven. These are Jesus's words, all right? He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, find. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You know, it's important to know where you stand with God. So some of you need to start asking, where am I at in my relationship with the Lord? Are you, are you exploring God or are you stalled out? You kind of like Aaron was, you stalled out in your faith. Do you believe or do you doubt? Do you have questions or are you seeking answers? Do you know God? Or are you searching after God? Because if you start searching, I guarantee you this, you will find him. And when you know God and you find God, it changes you. Look, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he truly is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he came because he loved you and he wanted to die for you on a cross so that you could have eternal life with him. That changes who you are. The gospel begins to break down the, the things that hold you back and hold you captive. We call that slavery. Um, that's what that's the Old Testament, or the, the, what, what the New Testament word tells us. It's like you're slave to your sin, all right? But it sets you free from that sin. We believe if you come to know God, it will change you and you'll begin to be set free and to live free. You know, I read a story once of a, of a woman who uh, was mauled to death by her pet tiger. Um, true story, honestly, and it's kind of a sad story, but then you're like, why'd you have a pet tiger? You know, it's like one of those moments where you're like, who has a pet tiger? Like who goes out into the wild and gets this giant beast of an animal and says, come live at my house with me, right? But that's not how it works, is it? Look, it probably went something like this. Um, mama tiger got killed and she found baby tiger and she brought baby tiger home and baby tiger was cute right? And she gave baby tiger a name, Tigger or Sweet Pea or something like that, right? And baby tiger was special to her and he was cute and cuddly and right, he had these big furry paws and he would nibble at her, at her, uh, at her ear and he was cute and everybody thought it was all nice and pretty and she, she just loved baby tiger until what, what happened? Baby tiger grew up and he became big tiger and big tiger decided to go back to his, his natural instincts and he mauls the owner to death. You know, truth is mankind has the similar tragic story of our own pet tigers. There are things in our lives that sometimes at first we don't think much of. Your addictions and your anxieties, your fears and your problems, ultimately our own sinful nature, that's what it does to us. You know, we give in, at first it didn't seem like that big of a deal, and then before we know it, it begins to build, and we feel like we've lost full control. It's like this, the alcoholic didn't start off with a bottle of whiskey at 7 a.m. They didn't start off with a case of beer to make them feel good. No, they started off with one drink that led to another drink, that led to another drink, that led to another drink. Look, 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 the worker that's seeking approval didn't start off working 80 plus hours a week, uh, not, not really giving any time or attention to his, his wife or children. No, he started off with a pat on the back, a good job, well done, man, you're making a difference to another, to another, to another, 
to another. Like, like the drug addict didn't start off uh, shooting up heroin that he had uh, taken the money that he had stole from his grandma to, to get that, that drug. No, he probably started off with a group of buddies who had a blunt and they smoked it and then another and then another and then another. Look, the man or woman addicted to pornography didn't start their daily desire to spend every waking minute looking for this type of corruption in a magazine or sex shop or phone apps or internet surfing. They started off with a second glance that led to another, that led to another, that led to another. We all have these things in our lives that are looking to hold us down. The world will, will look to, to, to give things like pride and anger, sex and comfort and greed and drugs, and they become these pet tigers that have grown up and are looking to maul us to death. That's what sin does. But listen to what coming to know God does in your life. Listen to what the word of God, what Jesus does. It says it like this in Galatians 5 verse 1. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You see, when you seek God and you come to know him, it begins to set you free. Doesn't mean you're not gonna make mistakes or you're not gonna fall from time. Doesn't mean it's not gonna be a battle and a fight. But there's a freedom that comes in knowing who Christ is. There's a sanctification, a big term for becoming more like Jesus that happens in your heart so everything we do around here is set up around that goal to remind you that you are being set free. We, we, we wanna foster relationships with people where there is encouragement and accountability had. We have groups of pastors, people that love you. Look, I work with a whole slew of ministers on staff here at Bethany. I'm so thankful for the people that I get to do ministry with each and every day. And I want you to know that there are people that love you and want to pastor you and encourage you. You can start with one of our, our campus pastors like myself in Vincennes or Josh Brown down in Princeton or Tom Watson right here in Washington. People that want want to pray with you, walk with you, help you get the, the, the resources that you need. It goes beyond that. When we, when we create environments, we hope as a church to have environments that remind you that you have been set free. Everything that we do on a Sunday morning is set around the ultimate purpose of seeing that Christ is exalted and that you're reminded of the victory that you have, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done in your life whether it be programs like student ministry or middle school ministry or our, our children's ministry, all these things send the goal out of that Christ has set you free. And when you are set free, when you experience the freedom that Christ offers, you begin to find purpose. Brian Stinchfield is one of our difference makers in our Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets at our Washington location. And if you know Brian, you know this. Brian's a hugger. He's a guy that wants to wrap his arms around you and say, hey. And Brian will tell you that before he began to search after God, that he found a lot of, uh, he, he searched after uh, uh, filling that hole in his heart, that thing in his life, his own little pet tiger. He searched after all kinds of things that he tried to fill that void with. But it wasn't until he started searching after God that he began to realize the fullness and Brian began to be set free from his addictions and past. And he began to live with a renewed purpose. Brian is a perfect example that God doesn't say, I'm gonna forget the past. Instead, God says, I'm gonna redeem your past. You know, all those things that you used to struggle with, I'm gonna help you help others to to come to know who Christ is. And because they know Christ, I'm gonna help them come out of their own addictions and their own struggles. I'm gonna use your past and redeem it for great good. God created you for something. Look, he created the church for something with a purpose. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says it like this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. At Bethany, it's our hope that you would find your purpose in Christ and see how God can use that purpose to help others come to know who he is and how they are loved by him. That you ultimately become a difference maker. You know, if we keep the main thing, the main thing, well, the main thing is gonna change everything. If we keep Jesus at the center of all that we do, he's ultimately the greatest difference maker. Listen to what John 8 verse 12 says. It says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's John 8 verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me 
We'll never walk in darkness, but we'll have the light of life. That Jesus is the ultimate difference maker. But you know, inherently inside of each and every one of us, we want to make a difference. You know, this weekend, uh, we were on our way home yesterday from uh, Thanksgiving with my in-laws who live over in Columbus, Ohio. And we're cruising down Interstate 70, um, you know, just chucking along, making our way home. Um, I'm listening to something uh, in my, my ears. My kids are watching a movie in the backseat of the car. And all of a sudden, the car's just like, it's not, it's not working right. So we, we broke down, uh, co- coasted off an exit and pull over to the side of the road. And there's transmission fluid all over the place. And I'm like, okay, we're stuck. Um, middle of nowhere, Ohio, um, Highway 56 um, in Ohio. If you know where that's at, it doesn't really matter um, to the story. But uh, long story short, here I am with my, my, my four kids and my wife and our dog uh, on that case too. And it's cold and I'm on the phone for an hour trying to get roadside assistance, somebody to come out and get a tow truck. And finally it's like, okay, we're, we're stuck. Um, all right, what, what now? Like, just so you know, tow trucks don't take six people with them when they tow your vehicle to the place. So I'm like, okay, I got to get my family somewhere. And I'm like, all right, we got to load them up. So I'm like, my wife and I get all of our kids, their coats on. And um, we're like, kids, we're going to stay on the side of the road. And we're going to walk up. There's a gas station a mile away. So we start walking down the road. And uh, this lady pulls up behind us honking her horn. And she's like, hey, hey, what's wrong? Can I help you? And I said, yeah, we're just walking up to the gas station. She's like, get in the car. So we, we hop in the car. Her name's Aaron. Um, and uh, Aaron's like, you know, what happened? Uh, the car's broke down. I don't think it's going anywhere. And try to figure out getting a rental. Um, she's like, okay. She's like, hey, you're just going up to the gas station? Yeah. She's like, I can't let you go to the gas station. She's like, I just live two miles up the road. I'm going to call my husband, Chip. Um, I'm going to let him know we're coming. So she calls her husband where he's like on speakerphone in the car. And she's like, sweetie, I'm bringing uh, a whole family to the house. They're four kids um, and their dog. And uh, I know you're watching the Ohio State Michigan game, which is a big deal in Ohio uh, was going on. It just started. And you're like, I know you're watching the game, but I'm going to come over. So we go into this guy's house. He's sitting in PJs, like pajama pants, a white V-neck shirt. And he's just like, oh gosh, what just happened? You know, one of these moments. And he said, hey, how can I help? And I said, look, uh, you know, I'm trying to get a, a rental car. Um, he says, hey, I'll, I'll take you. I'm like, no, you're going to watch your, your ball game. I'll figure it out. And he's like, no, I'm going to take you. So he, he gets clothes on. We head to the rental car place. Um, we get back to our house. I get all the kids in the car. And um, I looked at him. And I said, Chip, man, I, I don't know how to thank you. Can I, can I offer you some money? Can I? He said, look, man, I'm just glad that I could make a difference and help you out. You know, inherently in each and every one of us, we have that same desire to make a difference. Now, remember that passage from John 8, where it said, I am the light of the world. That's Jesus speaking. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says, you, you are the light of the world. That's just Jesus speaking here. You're a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You know, in this life, we are called to be difference makers, to shine a light amidst the darkness. And at Bethany, that's our hope, that we create groups of people that go out and they make a difference in their community. Now, I, 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 I'm so thankful for the help that Chip and Aaron offered to us, but the difference that we can make as followers of Christ goes far beyond helping somebody get a rental car. It has an eternal significance, an impact that can break the chains of slavery and sin through the power of Jesus and help people to come to find their purpose that then makes them difference makers, that then helps others come to know God and to live free and to find purpose and to be a difference maker that then helps others to come to know God and to live free and to find difference and to be difference makers, right? And that's the purpose and mission of the church. And we only accomplish that as God's people working together as difference makers. One pastor said it like this, Jesus is the hope of the world, but the local church is the vehicle of the expression of that hope to the world. So you You, people of God, you are the church. We are the church. So go be the church. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for how you love us. 
God, thank you for Jesus. God, as I think about this, the holiday that we just celebrated of Thanksgiving, I'm reminded there's no greater thing to be thankful for than for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he loved us enough to come to this earth, to live a sinless life, and then to die in our place so that we could come to know you, to be set free and live free, to find our true purpose, and to ultimately be a difference maker that points others to you. God, I pray that if there's somebody in this place, in these rooms today that has not yet made you the Lord and Savior of their life, that they'd ask the questions, that they would make the moves, that they would search after you, and that they would come to know you, that you would answer their questions, that as they seek, that they would find, as they ask, that the doors would be opened, and that because they know you, that they would be set free, find purpose, and be difference makers for you. And I pray that each and every one of us would go out of here knowing that we are the church and that we would be your church to all who come in contact with us. And we say all this in Christ's name, amen.